Tesla imaging in Bergburger, Germany. Um, uh, Professor Baum is very well known in this field, has uh, published hundreds of articles on um, the treatment um, uh, of neuroendocrine tumors, and in particular the uh, PRRNT. Um, I have the privilege of visiting Backbroker uh, about one and a half years ago uh, to visit uh, Professor Baum's uh, setup, and he's here now to talk to us about the use of uh, PRRNT uh, in neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you, Professor Baum. Thank you for the thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I first would like to congratulate uh, Archie Patti and the whole team from the Singapore General Hospital because you have this year a small anniversary, it's the fifth meeting and uh, I participated in all and I must say every year it, it gets better and more interesting and congratulations for the nice program. So you heard about my topic, um, I'm coming from Bad Berka uh, which is since last year uh, in its center of excellence and uh, combines many different disciplines. As you heard, uh, your endocrine tumors really need a multidisciplinary approach. So you need internal medicine, uh, especially gastroenterology, endocrinology, oncology. You need the surgeons, um, especially the abdominal surgeons. Uh, interventional radiologists should be a good friend of you because there are many instances where uh, PRT is followed by uh, interventional procedures or the other way around and uh, we have of course also molecular radiotherapy uh, how we name now ourselves and the uh, imaging center with uh, PET-CT. Um, <coughs> in Germany uh, rules are very strict on how to uh, treat patients with uh, radionuclides and therefore uh, they must stay at our ward uh, for at least two days and we have 20 beds, 22 beds available for treating them. You heard already about uh, the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors. This is from a paper from Motlin from Lancet Oncology and uh, it's on the rise. These are data from the SEER database, especially uh, the GAPNET tumors, uh, the rectal carcinate or rectal neuroendocrine tumors, how we call them now, and the uh, bronchial carcinoids. Uh, I made a calculation, uh, especially for Singapore, as I know you start this year with uh, PRT, and uh, the incidence uh, now is thought to be a little bit higher, about five per 100,000, so you have 50 per million. That would make 250 per year in Singapore, which seems not a very big number, but as you heard, the prevalence of the disease uh, is much more frequent because patients live long, that would mean five per 100,000 or 50 per million, which are 195,000 per year in Asia. And if you look at the prevalence of the disease, is 400 per million, which would make it to 2,000 in Singapore and more than 1.5 million in Asia. So the disease is not rare at all. Actually, it is, uh, as data show from the United States, the second most common gastrointestinal cancer and uh, is, for example, more common than pancreatic cancer and gastric cancer together. So you should keep that in, in mind that the prevalence of the disease is very uh, quite high. Uh, this is uh, the cause because uh, the so-called uh, low-grade tumors, um, G1 and G2, uh, as you can see here, from this graph are uh, living quite long. Patients have uh, more than one decade uh, to live. However, if they have a G3 tumor, which means a high proliferation rate, which is linked also to a positive FTG PET scan, survival is much shorter. Uh, we recently published in uh, uh, Oncologo 2011 the, the classification and um, as you heard already, it's now very simple. According to WHO 2010, you have just G1 tumors, uh, which is a ki 67 proliferation rate of less than 2%. Then you have the GT, uh, G2 tumors, uh, which are between 3 and 20% proliferation. And you have the 
G3 is a low differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, where ki 67 is more than 20%. So as a nuclear medicine physician and as an oncologist dealing with neuroendocrine tumors, the first question really always have to be, what is the crate and the proliferation of the tumor? And um, then the other things come if it comes to PR and T. Then we have, uh, in addition, uh, now the mixed adenoneuroendocrine carcinoma, which uh, can happen in the pancreas, for example, but it's a relatively rare uh, disease, and we have the hyperplastic and preneoplastic lesions. 50% of the neuroendocrine tumors are non-functional. They are not producing a specific hormone we can measure uh, in serum, for example. And the others you heard already can cause all kinds of uh, symptoms from uh, carcinoid syndrome, flushing diarrhea, to hypoglycemia, to zollinger ellison syndrome, uh, which is uh, a really uh, very devastating disease with a uh, lot of uh, ulcerea and diarrhea. And you also heard about the uh, Vipoma uh, Werner Morrison syndrome, which causes watery diarrhea or glucagonoma with a necrotic uh, migratory erythema and diabetes. So coming to PRT, I would like to give you some uh, insights on how to select patients for PRT uh, on the choice of the peptide and radionuclide, uh, some words on kidney protection, on dosimetry and uh, toxicity in, in follow-up monitoring, and the clinical results. So our concept in Bad Berka from the very beginning was to treat this tumor uh, with a multidisciplinary team of really experienced net specialists. So we try to find a, a summary um, how to select patients which is based on clinical aspects, molecular features. Um, you have to treat only patients with progressive tumors. That's very important because many patients, even if they have widespread uh, metastases, have stable disease over a long time. Those patients with uncontrolled symptoms despite maximum conventional therapy and, of course, high somatostatin receptor expression because this is a mean uh, how we can treat this tumor as higher uh, the uptake in the tumors as higher usually is the dose. And then uh, individualized uh, therapy plan for each patient. So we did not really perform any formal clinical trial. And uh, we try to summarize this in the Bad Berka score, which I will uh, explain a little bit later to you. Uh, from the very beginning, we were thinking uh, like in thyroid cancer, uh, which is also, uh, if it is differentiated, a slowly growing tumor, to do frequent cycles. So at least four cycles to six cycles, uh, up to 10, we have given now applying low or intermediate doses of radioactivity. So long-term, low-dose, not short-term, high-dose concept. And then the combination of yttrium-90 and lutetium-177 in sequence, uh, or in few patients we did also uh, what we call tandem therapy, the concurrent therapy, and the intra-arterial application. I will show you later why this has uh, some advantages. Uh, this is our, our team, the some core team, I would say, the main people involved, our surgeon, Merten Homan, Dr. Petrovic, who is an interventional radiologist, and my colleague, Professor Hirsch, who is in one person, gastroenterologist, endocrinologist, and also has a qualification as oncologist. So the Bad Berka score um, is just a, um, a summary um, of which features are really important for selecting patients. So as I told you, the first thing is that you have, of course, to ask, uh, does a patient have uh, receptors? And if there are receptors, what is the SUV if you are using a receptor PET CT? Or if you are using simple octreo scans, you can uh, still use a sequenning score. So I cannot really um, recommend that in our days. Then the second thing is renal function because all these peptides are cleared uh, by the kidney and uh, hematological issues are important like blood counts. Then other features come into our mind like liver involvement, extrahepatic tumor burden, 
Uh, as you heard, the ki 67 index and tumor grade, uh, and this can be measured in vivo by a metabolic imaging using FTG PET. The tumor dynamics, the doubling time, when are new lesions coming up, and then the general status of the patient like Kanofsky performance index, weight loss, which is always a bad sign, and the time since the first diagnosis, the functional activity of the tumor and previous therapies. Though when you try to get all this in a standardized way, then you uh, can come to a conclusion. So the first thing uh, what we must really know is uh, receptor density. And we were all used and educated in nuclear medicine, looking at images and saying, OK, it's high, it's uh, medium, or it's low uptake. But uh, if you look at these different patients, this is uh, by far not enough. I mean, this patient has a high uptake, this also. But uh, if you look at the, at the numbers, and we did an analysis in 1,400 studies, which we um, investigated with uh, gallium dodanoc pet -CT, and really try to uh, make a mean and a range. And if you look at the range of the SUV, for example, in lymph node metastasis, you see it's from 4.2 to 152. So you cannot, with a four-scale grading, you cannot say it's high or it's intermediate or low. I mean, 4.2 to 152 is a very, very big difference. Of course, then the question arises, if we measure SUV, on our PET scan. Is it really representing the number of receptors in the tumor cells? And we published a study uh, end of last year in the European Journal where we compared quantitative or semi-quantitative immunohistochemistry with our imaging. And here is uh, how we uh, proceeded. We first did uh, PET CT in the patient's uh, image, for example, primary tumor. Then the patient was operated and the surgical specimen was processed uh, uh, using uh, specific antibodies against the five different subtypes of the somatostatin receptors. And from that, we looked by a scoring system. Many of you probably know the HER2 scoring and the NASA score, which is uh, named uh, after Remele and Stegner, the IRS, which also takes into account the percentage of positive tumor cells. And when we uh, did that, you see patients with a low IRS HER2 score and those with a strong staining and that you can quantify and if we relate that to the SUV uh, on our PET scan, you see that there is a very good correlation, especially for subtype 2A, which is actually um, measured on the Dota TOC and Dota Tate PET and uh, that there is no relation to the other subtype of receptors. And this shows you the, the patient with the highest SUV we ever measured, 152 in a lymph node metastasis in the retrocrural region. We studied the same patient also with Dota Tate, and you see there are differences between different peptides. Uh, so in this patient, the Dota Tate just showed 103. And then we treated the patient with lutetium-177, uh, Dota Toc, and uh, five years after PRT, you see there is still remission of the disease. So you can really wipe out, you can kill metastatic neuroendocrine cancer cells if you have high uptake and high dose. And we did that uh, a little bit more systematic by looking at the gallium SUV max uh, before and after therapy. And we recently published uh, this paper in the International Journal of Molecular Imaging. And what you see here is that as higher the uptake on the gallium, as better are the results concerning the clinical response of the patient. The second most important thing after uh, the question, what is the uptake in the tumor, is what is the biology of the tumor? What is the proliferation rate of the tumor? And you can measure that uh, with the key I67. And uh, you all know the flip-flop from iodine once you one negative uh, thyroid cancer and positive FTG PET. And the same is true also in some neuroendocrine tumors. So for example, this is a FTG uh, positive um, case uh, with very low expression of somatostatin receptors. And if you look at his key I67 is uh, more than 30%. So this patient is uh, not suitable for PRT. Probably should undergo 
kinase inhibitor treatment or chemotherapy with streptosotocin. This is another example, very strongly positive for FTG, nearly negative on the uh, octo scan, and the other way around, very strongly positive with the gallium donatate and negative on the FTG. These are the ideal patients with a good prognosis. And we looked into that already in 1998 uh, with FTG, and uh, we published a paper on the relation between FTG and ki 67 proliferation rate. And just recently, and this is an example of that, we examined head by head FTG and gallium. And you see here is the gallium, and here is the FTG with some positive uptake in the liver lesion, which is negative on the gallium. And of course, this is growing because you get not any dose to this tumor, whereas the other receptor positive lesions are receiving a dose and are, are responding. So for those who are interested, uh, as I said, is published in the International Journal of Molecular Imaging. Kidney function, I will make a long story very short. Uh, I still think there is an absolute need to do at least one dynamic renal scintigraphy in patients before peptide therapy, because even if the serum creatinine and BUN is completely normal, you might have outflow obstruction, like in this case, due to very uh, enlarged liver and compression of the kidney. And if you treat this patient with yttrium 90 with 5 or 6 gigabeck rel, you just destroy his kidney. You cannot avoid it because the dose becomes very high and you must be aware of this uh, before you start treatment. In Germany, we started in uh, uh, July 97. Uh, with this first patient, uh, after MIBG uh, therapy, more than 1.2 Curie of iodine-131 MIBG, and then the patient progressed and received chemotherapy and was in a, in a very bad shape, and uh, we treated him with itgem 90 uh, dodatoc and he had a, a fantastic course after that, and that impressed me actually uh, very much, and from that first case we did now 15 years ago, uh, we have come to consensus guidelines uh, of INETS, which were published in 2006, 2008, and with me as co-author author in uh, December 2011, where is the role of PRNT and uh, where is the place uh, among all this novel therapy which we heard upon. And uh, also the IEAA has taken up uh, the issue, and there will be uh, this year, uh, maybe in a short time, a publication in the European Journal uh, on a practical guidance uh, of peptide receptor radionuclide therapy in neuroendocrine tumors, and I think it was a really difficult process. We, we met uh, over many weeks, actually, and discussed in a multidisciplinary manner what is the role, which are the best patients, and how to proceed. And that's why I think uh, the guideline is, uh, is really so important. Now, from a very small start with a few patients uh, per year, we have come to more than 500 treatment cycles per year. Um, I will not go into details concerning uh, the radionuclides. You all know lutetium is a soft beta emitter with a pass length of just two millimeters uh, and a physical half-life of 6.7 days, whereas yttrium 90 is a very strong beta emitter with a pass length of around 12 millimeter in tissue. And uh, we have treated now more than 1,000 patients as of December uh, 31st last year. Uh, we are using more and more lutetium uh, because of the very favorable uh, characteristics and low um, uh, side effect uh, profile uh, of lutetium. We have treated all, all kind of tumors. I think you will uh, hear from Giovanni Pacanelli more about the different tumors. Uh, you can treat from brain tumors, meningiomas, uh, to neuroendocrine tumors uh, all around the body, to very rare diseases like uh, esthesial neuroblastoma, uh, for example, arising from the nasal cavity. The number uh, are given here are uh, relating to the uh, organ uh, involvement, and you see that nearly 90% of the patients we treated had liver metastases. Though this was a very far ad advanced uh, patient cohort, 
and uh, a combination of liver, bone, and lymph node metastases was present in around 50% of the patients. And you should keep that in mind when you look at the outcome data. This is how we proceed uh, in practice. So we first do the gallium scan and the renal studies before the therapy. Then we infuse the amino acids and the cello. I will give you a, a few insight into that in a, in a while. And then we infuse over uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, the labeled peptide. And then we do um, actually dosimetry with whole body and SPECT CT. Uh, cello fusal or cello fusine um, is uh, normally used in uh, emergency medicine as a blood uh, supply if you have a lot of blood loss and it's reabsorbed by the tubulus and these are very nice scans by Marion de Jong uh, in animals showing you before and after cello and you can reduce the uptake of the radiolabel peptides by about 40 to 60 percent with cello. And uh, if we are using yttrium 90, this is how we uh, proceed in practice. So we first start the amino acid infusion, then we command the chelofusin loading dose, and we inject uh, uh, ondansetron and uh, cortisone for preventing vomiting and start the uh, uh, peptide infusion. We continue the chelo and uh, the amino acids for about three to four hours. and. Um, I must say, uh, for me, it was new that in Milano, the second day after therapy, you all also give sometimes uh, amino acids. And we do that now also because uh, we, we think we can further reduce the dose, especially in patients with a very high tumor load or already reduced uh, kidney function. On dosimetry, I will also make it very short because you will uh, hear a talk by uh, Kalibi Karemo. Uh, on that issue, just to say, in external beam we are very sharp, but uh, in radionuclide it's more like a dark man fighting in a tunnel uh, to find the way. We try to improve this by individual patient dosimetry, by creating software tools where we can uh, measure in a standardized way and using uh, organ and tumor dosimetry by o Olinda program. We compared uh, in a patient cohort Doda Tay, Doda Nock, and Doda Tok. And uh, again, to make a long story short, these were 253 patients systematically followed up. Uh, we found some differences uh, in the renal dose and in the whole body dose. And we found differences uh, in tumor uptake. So Doda Tok has a higher uptake, but it has a shorter half-life uh, in the tumor itself. So the area under the curve between the Doda Tate and the Doda Talk is nearly uh, the same. Though there is no real difference concerning tumor dose in our experience when you are losing uh, lutetium labeled Doda Talk or Doda Tate. The mean absorbed doses uh, to the kidney, you see the numbers here, which are uh, comparable, uh, fortunately, between all the centers. But uh, the situation is, uh, as you see here, everyone has its own little tool. Uh, to play with, there is no standardization, and that's why we are started now a very nice collaboration with the Austrian Institute of Technology, and they are cre creating the Simtara software for therapy planning uh, based on uh, hybrid uh, phantoms, a very new, very exciting approach, and I very much hope that uh, within worms especially, we can follow up uh, this concept and try to make a more a homogeneous database uh, concerning uh, the treatment of patients. For renal toxicity, I think also Giovanni Paganelli will give you a lot of data uh, on that, so I make it again very short. Um, using yttrium 90 or lutetium or the combination uh, of yttrium 90 and lutetium, we saw a mild drop of uh, GFR and TER, but it's not uh, in any way clinically important. And this is just one uh, patient, one typical patient followed up for five years after seven cycles of yttrium 90 and lutetium. And you see we always measured TER and GFR before. And actually, it was a little bit higher uh, than before the beginning. So if you do really strict nephroprotection, you can avoid um, toxicity, renal toxicity. The impact on the clinical status of the patient. Of course, this is the most important 
for the patient, not only the life, the longevity, but also the quality of life. Uh, and we found an improvement of clinical symptoms in 85% concerning, for example, diarrhea, flushing, pain, and other symptoms. 75% of the patient could give up or use less of uh, sandostatin. And if I hear that nearly all the patients have to pay from their own pocket here, one must say you save much more by not using sandostatin after PRT than the cost for PRT. Uh, weight gain happened in 5% uh, or more in underweight patients uh, in 95%. And this is always a good sign. Look at the weight of the patient. If the patient is losing weight, something is going wrong. If the patient is gaining weight, something is uh, going well. This is uh, just one example of a vipoma with a Werner, Werner Morrison syndrome, widespread liver metastasis. The patient needed 80 milligram of sandostatin per month, so four times 20 milligram. Uh, he got injected every week with uh, 20 milligram and still ended up in uh, ICU uh, with dehydration and very severe symptoms. We gave him just one shot of yttrium 90 dodatate and you see the course of the disease uh, on, the, on the imaging. But what was more impressive that was that the patient could give up three months after peptide therapy completely on sandostatin and until today has not used it uh, anymore. So although patients are doing well after PRT, it's not like chemotherapy where you have a lot of uh, adverse effects. This patient was on, on his motorbike two days after therapy and this female researcher, uh, 35 years old, um, was in Africa and sent me a postcard uh, just one week after PRT. So this is a, really the typical patient. Of course, there are uh, also patients uh, who have more symptoms, but this is relatively rare. Concerning hematological toxicity, you closely have to follow blood counts after therapy because many patients have a mild drop uh, in blood cells and uh, grade one or grade two anemia is, in my view, the most common adverse effect and more relevant than looking at the kidney. Uh, if you follow the patients for a long time, those with chemotherapy, you should have a keen eye on because some develop what we call myelodysplastic symptom, MDS, uh, but this happened only in patients uh, after chemotherapy and radionuclide therapy. And of course, there is uh, increased uh, toxicity in patients uh, with previous chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Though so the overall results, uh, um, and please remember, these were progressive patients before treatments was that we had in 92.5% uh, of the patients a response. Only 7.5% had progressive disease after therapy. And this is another patient uh, with only one kidney because a neuroendocrine cancer was arising from his kidney. He came crawling in my room, actually, with a lot of uh, lymphedema caused by massive uh, uh, lymph node metastasis in the abdomen. And you see the course of the disease and the improvement, actually, of his kidney function after therapy. And on CT scan, as well as, uh, as, well as on molecular imaging, you see the uh, reduction of tumor size and the reduction of uptake in this lymph node bulk. And again, the diameter from 6.5 to 2.6 centimeters. So progression-free survival was 44 months in our patient cohort. And uh, this is, uh, again, one typical example of a metastasizing mediastinal neuroendocrine tumor with widespread metastasis responding very nicely to therapy. The most important figure, of course, is uh, overall survival, because this is hard data. You cannot manipulate this. And overall survival uh, median was 59 months. Um, in patients which we followed up for many years, which compares favorably to the data from Rotterdam with 46 months and uh, from Basel with uh, 45.6 months. However, the Basel group reported uh, especially renal toxicity in 9.2% uh, grade 5, which is, in my view, a quite high number because we had only one out of 1,002 patients who developed renal failure 
and I exactly know in this patient what, what uh, went wrong because it was intra-arterial uh, therapy and we did a kidney protection and the you know, angiographer, the interventional radiologist needed a lot of time to place the catheter and we were running out of the kidney protection and injected in a phase when there was no kidney protection. So I know exactly what went wrong in, in this patient. The last uh, minute I will just spend on uh, what we call new avenues or new approaches, which uh, is intra-arterial PRT, which, will, which I will discover. And uh, also uh, I will speak a little bit about combination uh, therapies. Intra-arterial PRT allows you um, to to start, excuse me, uh, uh, ex uh, allows you to deliver uh, much more dose uh, to the tumor up to 300 percent, and that uh, gives you very favorable results up to cure uh, of patients with uh, metastatic liver disease, like in this patient. Um, and the other way is uh, that you can combine transarterial chemoembolization and seared, for example, with peptide therapy. Uh, when the patient is losing receptors uh, and still needs therapy, you can do safely um, uh, taste with uh, DC beads, or you can do, um, this is one case, uh, very uh, impre impressive uh, response, or you can do seared after PRT. Uh, in Myrtle cell carcinoma, we have just published uh, a paper in Annals of Nuclear Medicine uh, showing that you can combine doxorubicin uh, with PRT uh, in these patients. And our surgeons are very happy uh, when we reduce the tumor mass uh, before surgery by neoadjuvant uh, PRT, like in this young female with a massive lymph node metastasis of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, and by two cycles of yttrium 90 we reduced the tumor and then the patient uh, went in and did a ripple resection of the tumor uh, and the patient now is uh, four years after the surgical procedure and PRT tumor free. So this is my uh, nearly last slide summarizing my talk saying that PRT is effective even for uh, very advanced cases. Uh, median overall survival in our patient uh, cohort is 59 months. PRT leads to significant improvement of clinical symptoms. And I think this is, uh, for me, still uh, the most important feature. Cure is rarely possible, but you do not need to cure many of these patients because patients can live for many years, even decades, uh, with their disease. And excellent palliation can be uh, achieved. And in progressive, net sequential, what we call duo PRT, uh, is most effective in these patients. Significant kidney damage can be completely avoided if you are doing uh, strict nephroprotection and PRT I think should be in the hand of those who have experience, who have trained staff, uh, who have multidisciplinary team. I would like to thank my team in Barberka, especially the radiochemists and the nursing staff among my colleagues. These are really very important for the patients and for those who are interested uh, in the topic, I uh, would like to announce the second World Congress on Gallium-68 uh, generators and radiopharmaceuticals and molecular imaging, which will take uh, one year, actually, from now on, before the next uh, Singapore General Hospital meeting, and it will be in India, uh, in Chandigarh, and uh, Professor Balchinder Singh uh, will be the Congress president. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bong, for a very exciting um, talk. And um, I still remember the hospital that's built um, off the cliff and a very nice environment for uh, patients. Uh, and maybe some.